I still find the end of that quite haunting, that uh, little bit of music. Hello, everyone. How are you today? Good? Excellent. And you are alive. That is fantastic. Rich, you're okay down the back there, Mr. Richard? Yes. Well, fantastic. It's nice to see that a few of you have gotten up early and you've come in and you've got the opportunity to hear, to hear from one of our very interesting speakers this morning. Uh, our panel or our, our um, period of time this morning, we've actually got three investment companies for you to take a look at. We also have three opportunities for you to increase your wealth of knowledge in this space as well. And that's where we're going to start. I'm not going to talk a lot at the beginning. I'm just going to get Paul DeWin to come up here and join me on stage. Now, some of you, if you're local Singaporean, of course, you'll know who Paul is and what his role is. For those of us that aren't, though, have come up here almost like on a holiday, Paul, to uh, learn a little bit more about investing in Singapore make you a great start for day two. So Paul actually joined the Singapore Exchange as head of global sales origination. That was back in 2021. So you've been here for nearly two and a half years. All right. Uh, now his role there is to drive the growth of SGX's group's international presence. I'll just stand up so I can see you in the back there, excuse me, including strengthening client engagements globally and overseeing SGX group's specialized sales teams and he's got 10 cities to deal with as well. So do you get to fly all over the place or does COVID mean you actually get to sit in Zoom? It's a bit of traveling again. Bit yeah. of everything. Okay. So you're leading strategy, delivery of the equity and debt capital market businesses, as well as the development of distribution channels for SGX groups, products and services across all assets classes. And as I say all of that, because we're just an intimate small group here, I think if I'd have been saying that last night after drinks, that would have been a real tongue twister for me to get out as well. So today, what we're going to talk about is, well, the first topic up for discussion to increasing our work of knowledge category here at Ford uh, Future facing uh, commodities is connecting resources to the Singapore capital market. So Paul is in a unique position to instruct us on how that's done. And if we do have any of our resources companies who've snuck in at the back, and I'm sure they will over the next 20 minutes, it's going to be a really interesting discussion for you, some really good take-homes. Would you please make Paul very welcome, everyone, today? Thank you. Thank you so much for the for the. Uh very kind introduction good morning it's my pleasure and honor to welcome you to day two of the inaugural future facing commodities gathering in singapore which connects exploration and mining with esg and sustainability bringing together leaders of the electric vehicles and the critical minerals industries Congratulations to Vertical Event, the organizer, and the founding sponsors, Tribeca and Argonaut, for putting this event together. And thank you to all the other sponsors as well, including some of our SGX broker members, CGS, Philip Capital, and Saxo. Greetings to the many companies and investors that have gathered here for this Resource Connect Asia event. Um, so that many of you have flown in from Australia, Canada, and other parts of the region. Uh, region. And I think, uh, you know, when you let a bunch of Aussies lose in Singapore on the night, then you cannot expect everybody to turn up too early the next morning. Um, hope you uh, enjoy your stay, meet investors, make more connections here. Uh, today, I'd like to introduce uh, the Singapore Exchange, some of the ways that um, resource companies can connect to the Singapore capital markets. I'd like to address four topics this morning. I guess that's on the next slide. Um, provide some context on the opportunities we see. I've got it here. Let's see. No. That's Oh, yeah. there we go. All right. Yep. Um, four topics this morning. Provide some context on the opportunities that we see for Singapore and South uh, Southeast Asia. A broad introduction to SGX Group. Some back background on the developments for capital markets in Singapore. And finally, some points on the outlook for the years ahead. Um, Asia Pacific and the Southeast Asia region are becoming more prominent economically, which is attracting capital flows. Over the years, the weight of Asia-Pacific in global GDP has risen from around 27% in 2000 to 
37 percent by 2021 um and continue to uh, uh, and continued growth is expected to um increase to over 42 percent by 2040. this resulted in a substantial rebalancing of the global economy from west to east driven heavily by the rapid increase of course of the chinese economy but increasingly also the rest of asean um with it we see unprecedented capital inflows uh, as a result of this the region today attracts uh, inflows of capital in asia which is making up 40 percent of global foreign direct investments and this amounts to over 619 billion dollars in 2021 the sources of capital extend beyond governments and corporates as family offices take a long-term view to effectively grow and transfer wealth across generations. More than half of global family offices are now increasing asset allocations to Asia Pacific. Underpinning these developments are the changing demographics in the region. Uh, you've already seen the power of this in China in the past decade or so, but we see ASEAN countries emerge very fast, presenting sizable opportunities across the 10 countries in ASEAN, the disposable income is set to rise significantly with the middle class, importantly, expected to double in the next decade. Digital penetration is also exponentially growing with a fifth of internet users or 100 million being added in only the last three years. To capture opportunities in the region, the choice of jurisdiction matters and Singapore offers real benefits for global business owners and investors. Singapore is very close to half of the world's population. Easy access to China, India, and ASEAN are only within six hour flight away. It's an ideal country to be based in to manage regional and global businesses. Companies based in Singapore enjoy protection from double taxation across 85 countries and trade promotion through 27 bilateral trade agreements. Singapore is also the only country in Asia with a AAA rating. It's ranked number two by the World Bank among 190 economies for ease of doing business. We operate a trusted and stable financial center with market infrastructure internationally recognized by global regulators and industry players. 46% of companies with an Asian regional headquarters have chosen Singapore as their base. And we now here have a global base of 4,800 companies from across the world with a meaningful presence in Singapore. We also have 700 family offices that are based here in Singapore, bringing in capital flows. Finally, Singapore is very deliberate in positioning itself optimally for the future with clear forward-looking policies put in place, such as the financial services industry transformation map 2025 by the Monetary Authority of Singapore to expand areas in wealth management, sustainable finance, adding 20,000 finance jobs over the coming five years. There's the Smart Nation initiatives, nationwide and whole of government efforts to digitize Singapore's policy processes in the urban environment. And then there's Industrial 4.0, which is moving the industrial base up the value chain to strengthen its position as a leading industrial hub for companies worldwide. SGX is the world's fourth largest global exporter of high-tech goods, produces five of the world's top 10 drugs, and is the fifth largest producer of refined oil. A brief overview of SGX Group. We're probably best known for being an international listing venue with over 40% of our list goes being overseas issuers. The largest part of our business, however, is in derivatives, where over the past 25 years, we've built the preeminent Asian futures exchange for major regional equity indices, FX and commodities as well. Derivatives linked to China make up a very important part of our offering. Uh, allowing participants to trade derivatives on, for example, the FTSE China A50 index on the equity side. This is the most liquid Chinese equity index offshore. Um, iron ore, one of the most important proxies for the macro economy in China on the commodity side, and on the effects side, uh, also the offshore 
the, the most liquid offshore contract for US dollar CNH. This makes us the premier risk management venue in Asia where global banks, brokers, and investors use one trusted platform to manage risk across all major asset classes and risk classes. The trust factor is important for us, so we apply the highest governance and regulatory standards to our business. Today, the SEX Group has six sub-brands. We have SEX Securities, that is our stock market, SEX Fixed Income, um, which is Asia's most international bond listing platform. Um, within Fixed Income, we also have MarketNote, that's a digital, digital assets joint venture with Tamasek. We have our index business, in SGX indices. Um, on the equity derivative side, it's our listed derivatives platform providing the most liquid offshore futures contracts for pretty much all the major Asian indices. I mentioned the China, the FTSE China A50 index. We also do the Nikkei 225, the Nifty 50 in India, FTSE Taiwan, and Simsky, which is the Singapore index. On the commodity side, we have our listed commodities business in iron ore, rubber, and freight. We have a um, carbon exchange that we're building together with, uh, which is called Climate Impact X. We're building that together with DBS, Standard Chartered, and Tomasek. And that is an exchange for high quality voluntary carbon credits. Uh, we operate the energy market company in Singapore, and we have the Baltic exchange on the commodity side, which we acquired in 20. 16, which uh, brings together complementary strength in, of Singapore and London as key maritime centers globally. On the effect side, we have uh, listed derivatives for pretty much all the major um, Asian um, uh, FX pairs. And we also operate in the uh, FX OTC space through our subsidiaries, BitFX and Max Trader. Singapore is a small place, so in order for us to be globally competitive, we need to reach across borders and cooperate. Today, SGX Group has uh, 200 overseas staff across 19 cities. We have nine global offices outside Singapore, um, which are really based across the world in all major financial centers. As the world becomes increasingly polarized uh, with a shift towards less, a less globalized world, it becomes even more important to build connections between regions and countries and that's especially the case in capital markets so it's to support the capital flows across borders we continue to build alliances and partnerships with uh, other exchanges and jurisdictions on the derivative side we partner with the national stock exchange of india uh, this was launched in july last year sgx here brings in in international investors to create a bigger liquidity pool for in particular the Nifty derivative products. Um, we've teamed up with the New Zealand exchange, NZX, um, combining NZX's market development expertise in dairy uh, derivatives with our global distribution capabilities to accelerate the growth potential of the, the dairy derivatives market. On the security side, uh, we have an MOU with the Shenzhen Stock Exchange to uh, jointly develop and promote uh, cross-listed ETFs. Uh, between Singapore and China. Um, with Thailand, we're working, uh, the Stock Exchange of Thailand, we're working on a depository receipt uh, linkage. And on the capital raising side, um, of course, very key for exchanges. We have listing collaborations with the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, uh, Tadawul in Saudi Arabia to reinforce east-west corridors to provide um, companies with seamless and wider access to, to global capital. A few things on our on our equity capital markets. Um, this is a snapshot. We have 600, more than 650 listed companies with a combined market cap close to 600 billion US dollars. We list a wide range of um, future facing issuers as well. Um, new economy companies such as NIO, the Chinese smart EV company that uh, got a dual listing on, in Singapore last year. We've got uh, companies with links to renewables, uh, for example, Keppel, uh, building Singapore's first hydrogen ready power plant, uh, Nanofilm, Semcorp, Semcorp Marine, mining companies. We have around 18 mining companies listed today with a total market capitalization in excess of $4 billion. 
Uh, this includes companies active in the gold, iron ore, coal, and other spaces. Um, and we think many of the minerals futures here, whether lithium, rare earth, could find appetite with investors on SGX because we've got that ecosystem captured. Um, we also have um, Australian companies listed on SGX, uh, seven listings with a total market cap of seven and a half billion dollars uh, from a wide range of issuers. We've got real estate sponsors uh, such as Cromwell, Landlease. Um, we've got owners of Australian real estate, Fraser's Logistics. Um, we've got dual listed companies, SIFMAC, that's an engineering company based in Perth. We've got AV Jennings, which is a property developer. And we've got primary listed companies, uh, IX Biopharma as a pharma company with R&D and manufacturing Melbourne, Oz Group uh, engineering company based in Perth. Um, why do companies list on SGX? Um, this is to tap access to global investors who choose Singapore as their trusted venue to access Asia. Um, it's two to tap incre incremental pools of investors in Singapore itself, sovereign wealth, family offices, wealth management, and increasingly retail across the region. Third is uh, to achieve regional and global prominence. This is ability to stand out in Asia and use the listing in Singapore as a way to expand across the region and indeed globally. Just a few words on the on the secondary listing of NEO. I mentioned that earlier. This is the Chinese smart EV company, um, a pioneer and leading company in the premium smart um, electric vehicle market. I think most of you will be familiar with them. Uh, they really came for to to, to SGX for 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 three region, reasons. Uh, one is to, as I said, gain that prominence across Southeast Asia. They look to expand their business here uh, in the region and use Singapore as a regional base. Uh, second is to tap the incremental pools of investor capital that we have in Singapore, uh, in addition to the, the, the investor pools that they tap in, in other venues, such as New York, where their primary listing is. Uh, but also a degree of insurance, increasingly important for Chinese companies with heightened geopolitical tensions, should, for example, their primary listing in the US become an issue given all of that. Um, the daily turnover of SGX um, NEO has increased 50% from 2 million Singapore dollars when it listed back in May 2022 to uh, $3 million as of March 2023. SGX is also Asia's preferred international uh, bond listing venue. Um, um, over 80% of the issuers originate from outside Singapore. That makes us quite unique on a global level. Uh, we're home to 1,800 fixed income issuers from diverse sectors across 56 countries um, with bonds denominated in 26 currencies. We also importantly have 360 ESG bonds listed on SGX, it's, it's growing fast. More than 50% of the um, listed international G3 currency ESG bonds uh, from Asia Pacific are listed on SGX. From a product point of view, we seek to offer a broad suite of integrated products that enhance our relevance and provide synergies across uh, provide synergies to the ecosystem of market participants. Most market participants trade uh, multiple products um, and therefore they benefit from meaningful capital efficiencies. Um, particularly good examples here are the commodity suite where we target a number of themes, seaborne trade flows, um, steel products, and recently also the EV space with the launch of EV battery metals future contracts. SG helps, helps to manage upstream and downstream price volatility while allowing participants to benefit from margin efficiencies when they trade products across one venue. Um, here's a closer look at some of SGX's commodities derivatives. I'd like to highlight a few points. In supporting the world's transition to Greener energy sources, we've launched equivalent greener transition supporting commodity derivative products in line with the physical market. Um, and examples here include our high grade iron ore, uh, low sulfur fuel oil and methanol futures contracts. The global 
decarbonization drive has fueled the growth of sustainable transportation, including um, electric vehicles. Um, we see our energy metals derivatives franchise playing an increasingly important role in the EV value chain. Uh, we launched a suite of um, energy metals derivative contracts in September 2022. And we recently were the first international exchange to launch cobalt hydroxide and lithium carbonate derivatives contracts. The suite of products provides physical participants with uh, robust risk management tools to manage their price exposure in the exposure of battery raw materials. Lastly, uh, the new area calls for investors to think about growth that will not only stand the test of time, but also um, is also purposeful and sustainable. Countries representing 80% of global GDP have committed to net zero targets. While there has been progress, Asia, which accounts for half of the world's emissions, still, of course, has a lot of work to do to meet its net zero goals. Um, Asia is diverse, and industries and companies are at different stages of their sustainability journey. We cannot adopt a one-size-fits-all approach, but we must facilitate Asia's holistic transition to a more sustainable future, and at the same time, balance the region's diverse environmental, social, and economic needs. Um, I'll share a few key areas where we look to make an impact uh, as an exchange in line with market needs. One is investment in, um, and it is, is on the side of their, our investment and risk management solutions. We launch ETFs that cater for increasing demand from investors in ESG products. Uh, we focus on ESG disclosures. Um, that's on the regulatory side of the business. And lastly, we are focusing on capturing ESG data so that investors can ultimately make more informed investor decisions. To continue growing in this area uh, of global markets, we have to widen our product offerings across asset classes and digitize, digitalized financial markets. We have to expand our regional and global presence to meet evolving demands from both businesses and investors. And finally, collaborate and connect capital across borders. They're also channeled into sustainable long-term growth and asset classes. With that, I'd like to end. I think uh, I'm, I'm getting the sign. Um, uh, I wish you uh, a, a great second day of this, um, of this gathering. Uh, and if you have any further questions, please come and um, check in with uh, me and my team. Uh, outside in the booth later on. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Fantastic presentation. We started slow, and we certainly built the numbers. The interest grew in the room. The Future Facing Commodities Conference is bringing together full spectrum of participants in the decarbonisation and energy transition theme. And our second talk today is we're staying with the creation of knowledge uh, today in this particular one. And this fellow, as he comes up beside me, I always get a little bit nervous, but I'm always really eager to hear his analysis on the markets and anything else he cares to talk to us about. This is the co-founder of Argonaut, who, of course, are our, one of our main sponsors of this particular conference. Eddie, I'm not going to say anything more. You've your credentials speak for themselves. Would you please put your hands together and get be prepared to? He's going to pose the question to us today: What is more important? Is it rocks, or is it people? All yours, Eddie. Please make him welcome. Thanks, Chrissy. Um, also, thank you for everyone uh, attending today. Um, the companies which have come from uh, outside of Singapore to all the Singaporean investors here, we welcome you. I think um, before I get on to uh, the topic, it's important to understand the context why future facing metals is so important. When you look back over time, there's been some major events which have changed household wealth globally, changed global GDP. The Industrial Revolution, the introduction of internal combustion engines, the rebuild of the world after World War II. The urbanization of China, and what that did to household wealth globally. It's Argonaut's view that the decarbonization of the world and the electrification of everything will have a similar impact. We think it's a multi-decade phenomenon 
And what comes with that transition to decarbonisation and electrification is a massive intensity in metals. So we think with these structural tar winds supporting the future facing metals for many decades. Just to put that sort of intense, uh, the intensity increase, and I'm sure you've heard other people talk about it, but there's six times more metals required for an electric vehicle versus an ICE. So it gives you a little bit of a context. So my subject is a subject which has a lot of debate. Um, I've been in this industry for 30 years. Um, Argonauts a specialist, um, stockbroking investment banking firm in natural resources. And it's a, it's a subject which continues to be debated um, long and hard. What's more important, the people or the rocks? And as you'll see, my answer really reflects as it transitions across the mining life cycle. So let's just jump into it. So with a mining life cycle, and many people know this so in the industry, but for the investors out there, we go through pre-discovery, we go through the discovery and exploration drill out phase. We go to the study phase, we go to construction and commissioning. We go to the primary production period, and then we go into the late life into rehabilitation, uh, mine closure and rehabilitation. So as I said, it's, it's an age old debate, what's more important. And as I said, I think it really depends. And we break up the life cycle for this purpose as people versus rocks, only into four areas. We taught the expiration phase, the production delivery phase, the production, uh, sorry, project delivery phase, the production phase and the end of life, mine life phase. So as I said, you know, for us, the view we have, it, it does depend at which stage of the life cycle. The other point we're gonna make is that there's mostly more dimensions at work than just people on the rocks. And we'll discuss that because there's some really interesting examples of what that happens. And, I, and we actually heard about one yesterday, which we'll talk about now. In the first phase, the exploration phase, we have a very strong view that it's actually a combination of people and the rocks. And some of the great examples, and we'll talk about this one a bit later on, is the great work which the guys behind De Grey did um, to make the discovery called HEMI. Um, I know it's gold, but the, the, it's, it still applies. Um, uh, and it was just amazing. We'll talk about it a bit later. But also from my experience, there's as much luck as sometimes good science and making these discoveries. And I, and I used the first example, Cosmos, and we heard about that yesterday because Tony Rivera and Terry Kramer made that discovery. They actually was good science in making the Cosmos discovery, but originally they went up there with a budget to look for gold. And they had all sorts of problems. They didn't find any gold of any significant uh, amount up there. They also drilled through something called the Kathleen Valley um, pegmatite, which of course is now the core asset inside of Lion Town, which has a valuation based on an offer by Abermale of 5.5 billion. So they actually discovered that back in 1997, but at that point in time, which comes to my other dimension of timing, it was worthless. It was actually a pain because it was so hard drilling through it. So, but there's, but Cosmos, so when they're up there, and as Tony Vera explained to me, the good the people part was that Terry Grammer was a great guy for going and talking to drillers. And he went and talked to the company across, the way into the next tenement block and they were getting some interesting nickel hits. They went back, they did some good science on the, the element which can join the Bellevue tenements, which are then owned by another company. Um, they stood back, they did an EM survey and had a big bullseye, they drilled into it and they discovered Cosmos. The first drill hole proved there was a mine there. So it was great science, but some luck because they couldn't find the gold. De Gruz is another really great example. It was a major copper discovery and that was, a, that was a drilling with actually no good science behind it, other than the people who originally had the tenement um, need to do work to actually meet their, uh, to meet their expenditure requirements. And they sent up a junior geologist, um, the area they wanted to drill, they couldn't drill because they didn't have heritage clearance. They ended up drilling another area. There was no directors available and the driller, drilling contractor, and the junior geologist saw some alterations at the bottom of a hole. They were only drilling at 65 metres. They saw a little bit of alteration. They couldn't get hold of a director to, to work out whether they were able to go past the 65 metres. They elected to do that, and the rest is history. And that became the, the backbone of Sandfly, which is very successful. Um, we can do lots and lots of these examples. Waits was another one which I was involved with. It was an oil and gas discovery. It was only going to draw to a certain depth. Um, 
the, the drill rig went faster. They had eight days of credit. They decided to go on, just spend the eight days, Origin's last hole in the Perth Basin, and they were going to walk away. Um, you know, the rest is history. They discovered weights here. Unbelievable. It's mostly outside of some of the iron ore is the biggest sort of economic discovery of any resource on shore Australia. Um, but discoveries aren't made, uh, aren't made without the drill bit turning to the right. And we see people like Mark Creasy and, and Robert Friedland who are massively big thinkers and, they, and they, they have great sites, great big thinkers, and they've also got big balance sheets, which allows them to be more successful. Um, and as I said about timing, so what we see is that as dimensions, people, rocks, but also timing and also luck. Um, just one thing to put a little bit of context. So this is um, figures that only about 6% of geologists ever get accredited with a discovery. So that means 94% ever make a discovery, um, which is a little bit sort of thought provoking, right? But there's lots of other geologists who are mine geologists as against you know, exploration geologists. In the, uh, in the period involving the project delivery, sorry, in the project delivery phase, we're very strong believers about the people. Project delivery is all about the people ensuring that study, the study phase is extensive and rigorous. Um, all risks must be addressed and particularly supplies to new age metals where we're seeing projects almost moving away from mining projects, almost to chemical plants and chemical projects. You need larger balance sheets which require the increasing complexity associated with these projects. It's decisions people make in this stage which sets the project, the mine up for the future. They have to set the right mine plan, the right plant size, to make sure they right size the plant for the project. They need to make sure they've got the right recovery process. Um, and if you get this wrong, you know, projects can be very challenged going forward and can sometimes you know, miss the opportunity. We also note that typically really good projects attract really good people. So even if it's the project's been discovered by people without the credentials and some other groups, good people get attracted to good projects. This is also the section where a project transitions from how big it is to how much money you can make out of it. Um, and that's a really interesting thing. And also you can quite often see an evolution of the board and management team where you'll see where it might've been geologically led at the start to be more mining engineer and more finance uh, involved in making the key decisions. In the, this period here at rocks, in the production phase, uh, we find that it's really about the rocks. Now I know, you know, the people out there who are miners might uh, disagree with me. Um, and I originally gave this talk to the CET, the Centre for Exploration Targeting. Um, it was full of rooms, full of PhDs and professors, and they um, a bit harsh. Or they, they thought some of my views were a bit harsh, but I'm I'm convinced that good rocks, if you, because this is on the assumption that the project delivery phase was done correctly. So you've delivered a project based on all the knowledge, and therefore it depends on if the rocks are great, you just make a lot of money, provide the commodity price is okay. Great rocks make some ordinary managers look pretty clever. And we've seen that over the years. But we also see some people who might have had a checkered career prior to making a, a, a managing a, a company with great rocks make very, very good decisions. And, um, and I think it allows great rocks and a good balance sheet allows people to make good decisions. Also made a comment about timing and timing is so critically important in the resources space. You know, you just think Altura versus Pilbara. Altura had a project right next to Pilangora, right next to you know, Pilbara. Um, it went under, but if it lasted six more months, I, today that company would have market capitalization in excess of $4 billion. Or well, you think a litre with Bald Hill, same thing happened. It didn't survive the downturn in 2019 for the lithium market. And today that company would have a mark cap between one and two billion. Instead, it doesn't exist today. In the late life of a project, we once again think this reverts back to the people. As the project enters its twilight, attracting, extracting the remaining economic value is really around humans and otherwise required during the prime production phase. And we know with mine closure and rehabilitation, it's becoming more important in today's world. Yeah, this is all about people. So it's an interesting thing when we talk about 
you know, rocks versus people. We also got this extra dimensions of timing and luck. I just want to put a bit of this against the backdrop of the life cycle in terms of share prices. And this is um, often people would know about this as the Lausanne curve, and it shows what happens. And, and I just want to point out we got this situation here with the discovery, we have the excitement phase. But the moment we see companies, and this is this is studies over many years by many, you know, and more and far more intelligent people than me, from the scoping study to pre-production or to commercial production, we see typically share prices dip. And why do they dip? They dip because there's not much excitement happening. Um, we don't get many pleasant surprises during this period. So how do we address that? We address that in three ways. The first one is the dual strategy of doing your study and continuing to aggressively explore. This creates market interest and hopefully makes a new discovery. And, and I do note, uh, I mentioned a company called Papillon, a, a chairman here, Ian Middlemas. This was a company which had went into a study phase on one project, continued exploring, made a discovery of a project called Ficola. Ficola was even way better. It's now one of the great mines uh, of the world, producing over 500,000 ounces of gold. But it wasn't the, the subject matter of the study period initially. The other one we see is bringing in joint venture partners or bringing strategic partners, investors at the head co level. This allows expertise to come in, balance sheet, it provides credibility to the project, it mitigates project delivery risk. It typically minimizes ultimate dilution. Even if you give away a part of the project, there's actually less dilution for the shareholders and it greatly enhances investor sentiment to a company. Um, and the other one is if you've got a commodity tailwind, which is, just keeps going up, you can over, uh, overcome that. But for those lifting companies, we most really, um, we might've had peak pricing for a period of time. But I think the point here is you bring this, these joint venture parties and you can do very well. Um, and just on that, Argonaut produces annually uh, in November each year, a publication, which is an absolute purist approach, which is focused solely on rocks. And what it looks at is the best undeveloped projects listed on ASX. It goes from those companies who've got a scoping study out to those companies going, before they go into commercial production. Um, and it's, I said, it's all about the rocks. It is agnostic to management. It's agnostic to balance sheets, agnostic uh, to funding requirements, and it's agnostic to commodities. There is some weighting to jurisdiction. And you know, to give you an idea, we've, we've, each year we study all the projects, but what we did, we did a study after five years, the first five years study in 2014, uh, and we looked at what actually happened in that period of time. And there was 28 unique projects of those, 20, this is the study was done in late 2019, which I um, delivered to the university. Only four uh, of those there, 28 unique projects, only five were not mines. Four were for geopolitical risks. It just so happens that none of those geopolitical risks do exist today. So geopolitical risk is a major issue for everyone. Um, one, one was too early to go into production. But what it shows is that um, the, if you've got good rocks, and this was about rocks, they become mines. So 23 of those became mines in a period. Interesting other ones which are geopolitical. One in Salamanca, which is Berkeley in Spain, will become a mine when they allow that to be a mine. And peak uh, minerals, a peak and then a Gala rare earth project in Tanzania would definitely be a mine as well. So it was just really interesting that if you got really good rocks, you do become a mine. And it wasn't so much about the people because we're completely agnostic to the people. Just a couple of quick case studies, just showing what we mean about the rocks versus the people and, and how this can be success. This is the great Hemi discovery by de Grey. This was a um, work which was done. So the Yulgarn Craton, which is the main area for producing gold in, in West Australia, produced about 125 million ounces, whereas the Pilbara Cratons produced less than 2 million ounces, but they're of similar size, similar age, are keen rocks. And it was a question by a guy called ne uh, Alan Nishal, how, why is that? And he was able to write a study and say, the mineralization is a different style, it's intrusive related. He announced in 2nd of July, 2019, that they're gonna go and explore for intrusive related. He named seven targets, one including Hemi Falaga, which by the way, they've changed now to Hemi, um, too challenging that word to say. And they made a, they drilled the first holes in December, so four, five months later, 
uh, air core holes, they went back and did some further drilling. They looked like they like what they saw. And what happened was this great discovery here. And so that was what I'm saying. That was all about the people and all about great science. Um, those guys have been awarded prospects of the year and all sorts of other uh, credits to their name. But now they're going through that study phase and this project is so special. Um, they're doing extensive work and this is one which we think will you know, perform and be a great mine because the, ro the rocks are great as well, but there was great science behind this discovery. Here's a company which um, Capricorn, and, and by the way, DeGray's been a great client of ours, and, as has Capricorn. Um, Capricorn was a project which was mine ready for an extended period of time, but you can see it was flat lining. So all through here, it was mine ready. It done the studies. A new team comes in right here who actually have credibility. So this is, I mentioned before, I think during production phase, it's more about the rocks. Well, these guys are the, these are the top management team, ex Regis team, Mark Clark. He came in here, he looked at the project and said, well, I, I think the study needs to be revised. He revised the study. Um, dropped the cutoff grade, made it a bulk mining lower grade operation. And now this is one of the most successful mining companies uh, on ASX. Uh, Gold Rose, another one which did the partnership with Goldfields, realized it didn't have the expertise most really to deliver. And they avoided the Lausanne curve by coming out with their scoping studies and just going up. They missed, they didn't have the dip, which everyone else did because they actually brought to the table Goldfields, one of the great mining, gold mining companies of the world. Sorry. Um, the last one, Kidman, which was an interesting one, which is once again, this sort of gives you a bit of background against luck. So Kidman was a company which had acquired around here, the Mount Holland project. And their focus was on finding gold to go into their Burbanks project. They drilled below a pit. I think it was the Earl Grey pit and looking for gold. And they found an absolute magnificent ore body uh, which they called all grey and then they changed its name to uh, mount holland this is a project this company here was run by a former stockbroker who had a very good understanding of the market and what was great about this was here is he he took it forward he quickly brought in a joint venture partner sqm you would have heard about sqm now what, the second largest um, lithium miner in the world he brought them as a joint venture partner and then they ran up here, but there were some issues as to title and, and tenure. The share price dropped, but then he saw the opportunity because the lithium market was coming off in, in 2019 and he sold the company to West Farmers. Um, so that was a great return. So in a short period of time, the people who backed him for this luck made a 1,700%. Just want to finish off now just with um, some key takeaways. So... What's more important, the people or the rocks? As I said, it depends on the life cycle of the project, but evidence suggests at the exploration stage that luck and timing play major roles. I know the geologists here will say it's all about them, but let me say evidence and experience is otherwise. But you can't have luck unless you, you drill. Um, and there is great science, as I mentioned, but there's been a lot of luck involved. Um, project delivery is all about the people and even more so with future-facing metals. We said before, great projects attract, great rocks attract good people, and that can lead the establishment of world-class companies. Funding is always available for quality projects, but we need to be aware in the more recent period, there's been a growth in passive investing. So the active investors are no longer around. So sometimes your project will take longer to be recognized. Um, and the skill sets, required across a project mine a company or mine life cycle needs to change and evolve as it progresses. And we last thing we leave with those mining companies out there is don't gloss over technical issues. They always catch you out. So thank you everyone. I just want to say thank I want to wish those investors out there looking to invest in the space all the best with their investments in the mining companies that's continue to make great discoveries, develop great projects and help the world address decarbonisation and electrification. Thank you. Thanks, Eddie. Another great string to our bow there as you learn more about investing in this sector. If you are interested in uranium, just a heads up that our second auditorium is about to get underway. And there's a really interesting uranium project uh, up in the north of Canada in Alberta that you might like to listen to. 
Uh, we're going to change now to we've had our education, our two educational spots. We're now going to have a look at one of our companies, which you may like to potentially invest in. And as our speaker is making his way up to the stage, have any of you heard about the sword of Damascus or Damascus steel? You heard about it? You know what's so special about it? Scientists reckon that they've unraveled it. They put the, um, the particular steel through the ringer, as it were, and they've discovered that it contains high levels of vanadium which made them able to smash through the broadswords of their opponents. And this particular mine in India where the Damascus steel came from, its uh, location was a closely guarded secret. We're not going to be quite so closely guarded with the, the location of this particular mine. Will you come up here? This is Vincent Algrove, and he's the Managing Director of Australian Vanadium Limited. We've actually got three Vanadium uh, um, projects being presented to you here at the conference. One was yesterday, QEM over in Queensland. We are now going to Western Australia. So Australian Vanadium Limited are developing the Australian Vanadium Project. Um, Vincent here has driven the company's vertically integrated strategy from mine all the way through to batteries. And he's built a world-class team, which is we've just heard from Eddie, is a very important uh, ingredient in the recipe. Would you please make him very welcome? Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for the time today. And it was really great by Eddie to give that context. I think I felt very comfortable that everything Eddie said we have been doing over the last five or six years as we as we move this company forward, and um, in particular the transition to a producing company. So I'm going to head straight into this. The, the, the company is called Australian Vanadium, which stands exactly as it says. It's an Australian Vanadium company. Um, we are developing a advanced stage um, Vanadium project focused on producing around 4% of global current global Vanadium production. A little bit of why Vanadium, and I think um, as the, I think I'm either first or second up on the Vanadium side today, but um, I'm just going to let people know why is, why is Vanadium important to us. Um, vanadium is a steel alloy. It's 90% of its production is used in the steel production um, of rebar in China in particular. That's the primary market for vanadium. Um, the increased use of high strength, low alloy steel in this particular market really makes a change um, to the carbon usage of, of steel itself. And I think so. It has a very strong decarbonization lever uh, that is in play right now. Um, uh, it's not business as usual, but the more vanadium you use, the less cement you use in your building. So it has to be considered as a very valid point. Um, it is the primary use of vanadium steel in, in, in the market at the moment. Um, it is also a very important quality of life uh, metal. Um, it's used particularly in things that all of us use every day, aerospace turbines. It's used in chemical catalysts for asset production and in a way that we probably don't all realize how important it is. The other thing about vanadium, it is coming from uh, over 75% of the world's pr production of vanadium currently comes from three countries, uh, China, Russia, and South Africa. And that's an important aspect when looking at where new production should come from, in particular in the context of the ideal location of developing assets inside Australia. Um, one of the decarbonization opportunities within vanadium is actually the use of vanadium in, in long duration energy storage, an area where vanadium is starting to play a very important role uh, particularly actually in China, again, as they are the largest producer of vanadium, in developing long duration storage. And I mean long duration, large scale, scalable energy storage using a technology known as the vanadium redox flow battery, an Australian invention that has uh, traveled around the world through multiple um, product developers, including companies like Sumitomo in Japan, where multi megawatt projects have been developed. And we're talking four to six to 12 hours here of storage at base load. Now, this is a shift in energy storage mentality, one that the world is starting to rapidly take up. Uh, in this year alone, we expect uh, vanadium energy storage using VRFB to be over 10% of world production of the consumption of available vanadium. Um, and an innovative area, really important, since decarbonization is a really key part of, uh, and decarbonization of the, of the world's uh, vehicle fleet is a key part of our activities. Uh, particularly at this conference with respect to uh, lithium and other commodities. The use of vanadium in cathode materials is a growing area of interest in research as we move tech through technology levels two and three uh, and beyond, uh, improving charge rates and cycling efficiencies and safety ap applications. So it's a sort of watch the space area, but it's really important because, again, when it comes to the supply of vanadium, this is going to be really a key part. 
The company itself has been around for 11 years on the Australian Stock Exchange. Market capitalization currently of about $160 million. Um, I've been with the company for around eight years and we've seen that grow um, and, and kept the project funded over that time to ensure that we could develop our project from an exploration stage, as Eddie said, and growing the team and the, and the application through to our next phase of development. Um, more recently, we were pleased by the on-market um, appearance of uh, resource capital funds on our register, indicating that they'd taken over 5.35% of the company. Just a quick look at where we are, and I'll talk a little bit about the markets. So just everyone has some context. Map of Australia on the on the left hand side of your image, central uh, region in the Murchison. Uh, we have a port at Geraldton, and a, a mine is located inland. AVL has chosen this very specific. After uh, having conducted a PFS in 2020, we made a strategic decision that the best way forward for this project was to separate the mine and concentrate it from the processing plant, primarily to take advantage of Western Australia's unique situation with respect to those red lines, which are um, gas pipelines. Uh, the project is gas intensive when it comes to re roasting and recovering the vanadium. So we wanted to make maximum advantage of that at minimum cost. So the processing plant will be located at, um, at uh, near a place called Mullawad outside Geraldton, giving us a whole raft of opportunities. And I'll cover this a little bit later, but in terms of giving you a context of where we are, uh, important that you know the rest of this is really centered around that conversation. In terms of vanadium, we have to uh, always do your own research on pricing. There are some very good price estimates out there. And more and more so, those independent pricing um, and, and demand estimates are coming from uh, bodies that are understanding that the vanadium market will be stressed um, and there will be a strong demand for vanadium, uh, especially high-quality vanadium that can reach the energy storage market. And the thing we love about the vanadium battery um, but a flow battery market is that it is a good consumer, um, uh, circular economy consumer of an anti The battery material goes in there and stays there and can be recovered later. So where does AVL sit in terms of its planned production profile? Around 4% of global production as it stands today in 2022, uh, 23. And that red line is a uh, red bar that you see on there is a very conservative based estimate on a, a modest uptake of vanadium in the energy storage space. And you can see that while the blue line moves, a blue bar moves slowly upwards, that's increasing use and recognition of vanadium in steel um, across the world um, with vanadium batteries starting to shift both price and demand um, structures. And that'll have an impact on, um, on, on where the supply comes from. At the moment, it's worth saying that there's only three primary vanadium mines in the world. Almost all of the material coming on this cost curve comes out of one deposit type titanium vanadium magnetite, which is effectively an iron ore, uh, a special type of magmatic iron ore that hosts vanadium and titanium in its, in its, uh, in its makeup. Uh, Western Australia is very well endowed with uh, these deposits with over a billion tons in our region alone in Western Australia. Um, this is really important when you consider where the next primary production will come from. And also those production units around the world um, on the bottom of this cost curve, all three primary producers one in Brazil, two in South Africa, uh, are on the bottom of that cost curve. And as a company, we focused, razor focused on, on our operating cost as being all through our study work as being the primary objective for what we're doing. So just a little bit of why AVL is important. Um, we have a track record of being able to raise money, being able to uh, get garner government grants and actually fund and build the company in terms of uh, active and detailed work. As Eddie said, the ability to work with top players like Wood in our DFS um, and throughout our PFS work has really been essential to delivering high quality work for scrutiny later because it's good science and good test work that takes you to the next phase. Ultimately, what Eddie said earlier about the rocks is absolutely critical. Understanding them, understanding your processing is, is key. And then following that, having the right team in place to deliver on the project. Scalable, the project is scalable. We have um, a hub configuration, which makes us, gives us a unique selling point uh, with access to over a billion tons over time uh, of additional resources in the region to put to that processing hub. Um, obviously the jurisdiction, we'll leave it unsaid that uh, as Eddie said in the previous slide and other speakers have indicated, it's a great place to be. 
um, having completed the BFS actually just one year ago, exactly today, I was speaking in Perth when we delivered the BFS um, and having uh, uh, won a competitive $49 million government grant, um, which will allow us to kickstart the project as we get closer to development. <clears throat> the um, We are positioned both as an early mover in the vanadium supply chain, but also in the battery market through our subsidiary Vsan Energy. We focused intensively on the board over the last two years. Uh, one side acquired Daniel Harris, a 45 year veteran of the vanadium business into our team. Um, a few years ago, he'd got, he's worked in every vanadium project in the world, effectively um, has brought, allowed us to bring really key people onto the board. Uh, Peter Watson recently involved uh, with the strand line delivery, Miriam's on the board of, 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 of Pilbara. And uh, Graham's joined us um, from, from, from uh, Primero, where he gave up a pretty good gig uh, to come and, and, and take on the challenge of building this project. And I'm very, very pleased that he's, he's come on board and he's starting to bring all the people around him that have worked with him in the past to make sure we can deliver on this. Uh, led by our leader, uh, Cliff Lawrenson, um, very strong in the capital markets and a strong energy background with his chair of Pacific Energy. We're really looking forward to the next phase, building a very strong team right now. Again, just that slide, just to remind you how the configuration works, we'll mine and process the, the concentrate up at the mine side, move it down to the closer to the gas pipeline and then deliver a vanadium product at around 99.6% vanadium pentoxide and an iron ore co-product um, to the market and uh, through the Port of Geraldton. Quick look at the geology. As a geologist, I'm never going to let this slide go out of my deck. Um, however many engineers we have around, it's really good to have engineers around. It's, it's a great feeling, but the geology is uh, very, very important here. Um, we have a contiguous stretch on a granted mining lease uh, with a central processing plant um, to mine that purple layer, really part of the key part of the, of the story. It runs... Um, over a percent, in fact, the resource grade is 1.1%, giving us a very, very solid base and geometallurgy can very well understood. <clears throat> the, the PFS, uh, um, the BFS uh, metrics, very robust and, and that um, those uh, financial outcomes are very much in line as we stand here today, even though we're one year out, um, the uh, Canadian price is playing ball and it's turning upwards as that supply chain, the supply starts to, to shrink and, and not be available for the future. Um, the um, OPEX and CAPEX um, are what they're going to be. Uh, we really make sure we can finalize those through our work with engineering. I mentioned the regional opportunity. The hub does get there. And please come and see us at our booth if I miss out on anything in this, in this, in this deck. Um, ESG for us is about action, renewable action, community action, and strongly improving our governance, which uh, you can see from our board work. Integrating pit to battery. Um, the vanadium battery offers huge opportunities for uh, future consumption of vanadium. So we really want to make sure we've in that. We've created an energy subsidiary called vSun Energy, which is active in generating opportunities here in Australia for the use of vanadium batteries, contracting those with key partners. Um, and we were able to deliver into that through uh, a ele vanadium electrolyte strategy. We have an agreement with US Vanadium, an electrolyte producer and high purity manufacturer uh, in Arkansas. Uh, that company has allowed us to get a, a, um, a unique um, and um, exclusive arrangement to rebuild those plants here in Australia, which we're doing uh, in, Perth, in Perth, and we'll be building that over the next over the coming months of this year. Um, I'll skip that slide. Can you just come and talk to myself and Sam at our booth um, about the benefits of VRFP? It's an exciting concept if you don't know about it. Uh, we're delivering some of these now. We've already done some work on... on um, uh, on WaterCorp, we've got an IGO battery in commissioning phase, and we're delivering a similar battery um, in uh, in Victoria. There's a lot going on in the vanadium battery space globally. I urge you to keep track. Uh, I'll close here with um, our, our current activity, our focus, uh, really focusing on shifting towards an FID. That takes a lot of effort. We've got to make sure we've lined up our debt and equity and, or, and our offtake, and that's really an absolute focus of the team right now. Um, converting those into EPC and EPCM partnerships, and then moving towards uh, financial close later this year, uh, early next year, and getting to production in 25. So we see the end, we see the work we have to do. Uh, we've done a lot of good science along the way. We're good, happy to be at an investment conference like this where we can stand, 
and and show our project in its fullness and uh, let allow people to make an investment decision. We'd love to meet with you um, if you're interested in equity or or the a, a debt uh, situation with us. We have a very strong and busy strategy. We'd love to talk more uh, at an investment conference. I'm very pleased to be in Singapore discussing uh, this project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent. And just a reminder, the reason I don't jump in and say thank you straight away is I don't want to cut off that filming that's being done for us with the ASX, so I'm not trying to be rude. And if I've got any of my presenters here in the audience, I'll give you the bell at two minutes, give you a warning, I stand up at one, and then I'll hoist you off the stage, unless you're really, really interesting, and you can take my attention as well, you may get away with it. Uh, if you're into lithium, we've actually got lithium now presenting on both of our stages in Auditorium 1, uh, Auditorium 2. Here in Auditorium 1, we're actually going to talk about the only publicly listed battery metals company with advanced lithium projects in Southeast Asia, and it's strategically located in Thailand, which is the largest vehicle producer in the region. And the floor walker, the happy man behind me, I'd like to introduce you all to, is the founder and he's a leader. He's a seasoned expert in the business. This is Paul Locke. He's the founder of Pan Asia Metals. You've certainly got location, location all stitched up. Um, would you please make him welcome? He's going to outline the story and the opportunity that is presented to us by Pan Asia Metals. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So uh, Paul Locke from uh, Pan Asia Metals. I'm the managing director. Uh, good to be here. So uh, three key points to start with. One, and uh, someone just stole my thunder, but we're the only uh, company with advanced lithium projects in Southeast Asia, uh, which are, are have jork resources. So it's a fantastic position to be in. Two, we have two prospects. Each prospect is effectively a large or medium scale lithium project in itself. One of the prospects, the one at the bottom, Rion Ket, has a jork resource of 10.4 million tonnes and it's being upgraded. So we should see 30 to 50% added on that pretty soon. And we're drilling over at the Bangi Tum Lithium Prospect where we've got eight to 14 million tonnes of exploration target. And that's only a third of our target zone. Both projects combined should see us heading towards the 30 to 40 million tonne mark if we're successful in our drilling, which I think we will be. So it's a fantastic position to be in. And number three, we're not here to sell a concentrate. We will pr be producing a lithium carbonate or hydroxide, but we really want to get down to CAM, the third point uh, in the midstream of lithium chemicals. And we're having discussions along these lines. Given where we are in Southeast Asia, it's highly likely, in my view, that we'll be able to do a joint venture and produce cathode active material, which would make us the only lithium development company on the ASX and maybe the TSX, which is going past lithium or LCE, lithium chemicals. The board has five members and they've all been with us for a fair while. David Hobby and myself are the executive directors and we actually started together in Myanmar in 2012. So we understand Southeast Asia very well. We've looked at projects in every ASEAN country uh, and we've ended up with these two. We've got a few more in the pipeline but we understand the region and how it works. David Doherty uh, has been involved in Thai projects since the mid eighties. Supri is a Singaporean citizen, formerly with uh, McKinsey, uh, Citibank, um, the World Bank and so on in project uh, finance. So she's very well seasoned in project funding. And then Tanisak Chaniapoon is a Thai citizen, uh, very well connected with business and the government and helps us get through um, all the emotions to make our projects work. So a really solid team who each have an important function to make our company work. My go button's not working. There we go. The company is held, 45% uh, of the company is held by management and the board. There's not many companies, uh, listed companies globally where there's so much skin in the game. So whenever we make a decision, it's all about the better, for the betterment of the company, progressing the company with as little dilution and as much, uh, a much benefit as possible. So as investors, the investors can take comfort that, that if we do make a mistake, which is highly unlikely in my view, uh, that uh, we actually uh, wear the pain too. We've got a market cap of around 50 million. 
for a company with uh, lithium resources uh, entering into pre-feasibility or in pre-feasibility on one project, drilling out another and planning to deliver two pre-feasibility studies this year, planning to lodge its mining license applications this year uh, with some other projects in the pipeline. This is actually really cheap. We've got a good amount of cash on board. We can achieve what we need to. So there's a lot of upside in our company when we look at it compared to our peer group. The reason we like Southeast Asia and we're very focused on Southeast Asia and not just for mining, but for processing is that 55% of the global globe's auto production in 2021 was in uh, Asia. That includes India, Southeast Asia, China, Korea, and Japan. It's an absolutely huge market. And I think it's reasonable to expect that EVs will flow into that. So the region will also be a very strong EV and battery producer like it already is. So Pan-Asia is perfectly positioned to uh, benefit uh, from this growth in the region, a region with a, a very young population, highly educated, a lot of industrial centers, a lot of growth opportunity. And Pan-Asia Metals sits right in the center of five regions which are all moving into EVs. India uh, has Mahindra, which has been producing electric vehicles for over 10 years, not with lithium ion batteries, but the thinking's there. There's uh, about 15 two and three wheeler companies in India looking at electric vehicles. And there's, um, I think over five companies look at, looking at electric vehicles, all brand names we don't really understand if we're not in India, but a pretty important part of the market. In Vietnam, we've got VinFast, uh, with their efforts in batteries and vehicles, and they look like they're going to be very successful. Samsung has moved there to produce uh, cathode and batteries. Uh, I think Go and Goshen with Vinfast is producing CAM, an important region. Indonesia, there's a lot of activity around there with nickel because they're a big nickel producer. Malaysia, EV and Panasonic uh, building battery factories as we speak. And then we've got Thailand, the largest auto producer in Southeast Asia, the fourth largest in Asia. 14 battery electric vehicle projects, 18 um, battery projects. Uh, Mercedes EQS EV is being produced there as we speak. So if you see one on our roads in Singapore, or if any of you are from Australia, it's probably from Thailand. Uh, Great, Wall, Geely, uh, Great Wall, Geely and BYD uh, have started or will be starting vehicle production there and then battery production being the only company with projects which are advanced in Thailand positions us very well to capture the opportunities in this market. And that's why we're confident that we can put, move past lithium carbonate and into cathode active material. It's a major growth region with 2 billion people, half the world's GDP and all of the world's uh, growth. So it's a, it, it is a really important EV ecosystem. One of the factors that is not often thought about in projects is project finance. One thing banks don't like is geographic and commodity concentration. But what we've got globally is five key regions where there are many projects in the pipeline, whether they're being developed um, or to be developed. Uh, so they require a lot of project finance and they're all in lithium. So WA and South America are that, our key regions at the moment. There's a lot of activity on West Coast in the US and in Canada and in West Africa. One of the advantage, advantages we have in uh, Thailand or Southeast Asia is that being the only advanced project, there's one person in, or one company in the queue. And we've already fielded uh, inquiries with some uh, pretty good name brand banks, including the IFC, about our project and how interested they are in it. We've got a really deep financial ecosystem here. So securing a proper project finance facility for us is quite likely. Whereas if we're in other regions, unless you have one, two or three in the queue, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. I'm not saying it won't happen, but we're in a very good position. So this is another PAM advantage. Where we're located is about 30 to 40 minutes out of Phuket. So a lot of people want to come and visit us, but I don't think it's the CR project. Um, we've got two projects there, the Rionquet, which I mentioned at the start of the presentation with two prospects. 
Rion Ket and Bangi Tum, and then to the north, uh, the Katatong application area, um, which is comprises four project areas. Uh, we want to develop uh, Rion Ket, get that into mining license application phase. And then by then we expect Katatong to be um, uh, to be granted and we can move our drilling rigs and people up to there and start working there. So we expect to be um, lodging MLAs this year and I expect we'll be working on Katatong early next year. What's great about where we are is that if we're producing a concentrate down near where, in Pangna where we are, it's a short uh, truck across the peninsula to Surat Thani which is a medium-sized port with a lot of barge activity. And we just barged a product up into the EEC. And that's where we would we expect to be processing and producing lithium carbonate and then cathode active material. If we produce lithium carbonate at our project area where we are, then all it takes is a bit of rail freight up to the EEC, which would be much cheaper. But it all depends on where our inputs and output or inputs are coming from, acid, limestone, and so on. The, the advantages of Thailand is that it's an advanced industrial economy, the largest auto producer. But most interestingly for us is the Thai government's implementing a mining policy to encouraging, encourage mining in critical metals to secure their supply chain. Being the only advanced uh, project in the country, we're getting a lot of attention, which is really good. Thailand, I mentioned, is the fourth largest exporter of vehicles in ASEAN or Southeast Asia, uh, are the largest in ASEAN and the fourth largest in Asia. Most of those vehicles go into the Asia Pacific. So on Australian roads, most of the vehicles are from Thailand. If they're Japanese um, or, or Korean vehicles, they're from Thailand. And then they're exporting to Japan, North America and China, but only in small amounts. This is the supply chain and where we want to be positioned. So we want to move past uh, mining to a concentrate to produce a lithium carbonate. That's what all our work is focusing on. And we're in discussions to produce cathode active material to supply battery production in Thailand. If we have surplus material, there's plenty of demand in the region. We've got electric, electric vehicle production in Thailand already. And then the next big opportunity is recycling. And uh, depending on the recycling methodology, that can feed straight back into cathode active material manufacturing. So there's a really beautiful li little ecosystem um, emerging in Thailand and in Southeast Asia, which will have all of these functions. The cost curve is the most important thing to consider when you're looking at projects. So whenever we look at a project, we're always looking at location, proximity to ports, infrastructure, power, and so on, and where we think it will sit on the cost curve. We have a lipidolite-style project. In 2021, 18% of the lithium produced globally from hard rock was produced from lipidolite in China. This cost curve is uh, courtesy of Wood Mackenzie, so they're a credible source of uh, costing exercises, and it has the Chinese lipidolite projects in the bottom tercile. Being a low cost uh, uh, country, uh, Thailand also has the opportunity, or we think we have the opportunity to be placed similarly on the cost curve. Our projects, so two, two key projects, Rion Ket, 10.4 million tonnes at 0.44% Li2O. Um, uh, that's being upgraded. We have an upgraded mineral resource coming through in the next few weeks. And we've moved our drilling rigs to Rion Ket, where we've got an eight to 14 million tonne. Uh, exploration target. We're drilling that out now, and the drilling's going very well. One of the keys here, key points, is that going past Rio and Ket is a four-lane highway, and you can see the big electricity towers in the background, or one tower in the background, which is attached to the uh, a 240 megawatt hydro power station about 80 k's away. So we're on the grid to produce green uh, green product, and we've got plenty of land for solar. I've got to hurry now. Um, this is one of our cross sections. Uh, there's a lot of intersections at, at plus one percent Li2O. We focus on composite grades. It's great to report a thin intersection at one point five percent, but really it's what the what the total resource is going to be. Most of our composites are around thirty to forty meters in width um, and grading plus point six six percent Li2O. We've done all sorting work, and uh, we're producing. We, we can uh, increase our uh, ROM grade 
to above 0.9% Li2O, which would be the highest grade in the lipidolite peer group globally. Bangi Tum is where we're drilling now. The exploration target is about 33%. I've got a stander, that's not, not good. About 33% of our total target area. We recently did some rock chip work there. Um, uh, 44 or 64 samples averaging 1.56% Li2O, right up to 2.62% Li2O. Katatong is our application block coming up. Of course, we're very community minded, not looking. Uh, we've got a lot of community projects um, happening at the moment. So um, uh, our view is if our community thrives, uh, we thrive. So just the key takeaways, low cost environment, proximity to market, uh, large store producer in Southeast Asia. We're in a low cost environment. We expect to be at the bottom of the cost curve. Thank you. Yeah, lucky you've got one of the best smiles in the business, Paul. You can keep us captivated. Well done and a great start. No wonder you are happy, though, with that project. Which side of the stage did you want to go off? Were you stopping for a photo? Go that way. Pass me good. I won't kick you on the way out. All right. Let's go to manganese. If you're interested in or if we've got any of our explorers in the room or miners, producers, next door in Auditorium 2, CTI Energy is about to take the stage and they're talking about how to do things more sustainably uh, within those that ESG framework. So if that's your interest, run right in there. If you like manganese, you should be here because we've got Canadian manganese coming in. Now, Canadian manganese controls and is developing North America's largest manganese district. It's located adjacent to the US border in New Brunswick, Canada. Haven't been there. Has anyone been to New Brunswick in Canada? One, that's because you're Canadian. That doesn't count. No, the rest of us haven't. Okay. It's fine. We can talk to you about it later on. And we can talk to the, the president and CEO of uh, Canadian Manganese. Matthew Alice, where are you? Are you hiding behind me somewhere? You're up the back. Hello, you're in the dark. Come on up here. So would you put your hands together, everyone, and welcome our CEO, Matthew Alice, President of Can Canadian Manganese. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, so I'd love to tell you about Canadian Manganese. We are developing uh, a district, what we feel is a district in New Brunswick, Canada. Um, we'll go through our cautionary statements. Um, we have a... Um, a special company that's built on uh, the assets um, that have been around for 50 to 60 years. Um, they've been studied uh, for the steel sector, which at a time, you know, didn't work, didn't fit the, the market. And, you know, we're lucky enough to be in a time and place where uh, the battery sector is evolving. Uh, North American, North America's battery manufacturing sector is evolving. And we have an asset that sits uh, on the border that's that's well developed. So, you know, we're built on some key principles: the the asset itself, uh, the fundamentals, the size, the grade, the location, um, the established history of mining in New Brunswick, um, the team and the stakeholders that we have uh, our uh, kind of first class in the region. We understand the dynamics of of doing business in the region, the dynamics of getting um, the, the approvals and getting a mine into uh, production. Um, and then the value catalysts, we have just put out an updated resource. Uh, we are working towards a bankable feasibility at our mine site uh, at Plymouth. And uh, we're in discussions on partnerships with potential processors of this material. So, you know, when we talk about developing the, the future supply and where it goes, you know, I think Bloomberg NEF has done a great job of outlining the, the potential opportunities, looking at a couple different scenarios and the economic transition scenario they've deemed it and the net zero, looking at what the, the, the goals are through the Paris Accord. So the, in all these, you know, the underlying uh, kind of takeaway is manganese is, is poised to grow. And that is, uh, you know, not just... Uh, manganese that's been in the steel sector, but a high purity manganese sulfate that is being used in kind of the next evolution of energy storage. Um, you know, and, and to, to do that, and we'll go back for a second, to do that, you require, you know, stable long-term supply. So North America, and I'll get into it, is building a 
a manufacturing uh, industry that ha doesn't really exist and hasn't existed in North America. You know, Asia, as we just heard, Asia dominates a lot of the manufacturing for battery materials and batteries themselves. North America wants to build it. And to do that, we need to have our own uh, supply chain. So, you know, the inclusion of manganese, here's a list of kind of the, the, the cathodes that it's involved in, the percentage they make up of each cathode. But I think the biggest takeaway and signal is its inclusion in the car batteries and the manufacturers have implemented today. Uh, you know, the majority of car manufacturers have implemented NMC or manganese-based cathodes. Um, we don't see that uh, stopping anytime soon. Um, these, these entities don't move on a dime. They take a long time to, to kind of evolve. And I think this is where we are today. Um, so developing high purity manganese, what's important? You know, I think it's, it's a market that's very, you know, not misunderstood, just not understood in general. There are 12 producers of this product on the planet, 10 of them exist, are in China, one's in Japan and one's in Belgium. China controls over 90% of the world's supply of this material and the majority of that material doesn't leave China. So, you know, we say we're going to build cathode production, battery production elsewhere. It doesn't happen without uh, supply and then understanding how we do it. The, the intelligence on, on processing this material obviously lies in China. And that's where we spend a majority of our time trying to understand what's gone on, uh, how it's produced, what are the important factors. Um, and simply, you know, we lay out here the four real, you know, high level paths and routes to, to producing this material. But obviously the most important piece is what you're putting into your process. The ore you're sourcing, the type of ore it is, the impurities that stay in it and the, the, the levels of uh, continuity of both of those things are very important. Now, the, the discussion turns to, you know, uh, how this is hosted, carbonate versus oxide. And I won't get into the details of it, but traditionally oxide materials gone into the steel sector for its, you know, its ability to go uh, uh, absorb less heat in the process. So you can put it in a blast furnace, calcinate it, takes less energy. You know, fast forward to where we are today, those processes are, you know, qu quickly being deemed antiquated. Uh, throwing things in a blast furnace just to remove oxygen atoms is a smokestack that we don't need in a process when we're trying to decarbonize the world. So, you know, there's material like ours, like carbonate, that can forego that step, produce a cleaner and carbon efficient carbon, uh, you know, multiples better than what's being done today. So you go through these processes, and I think what we've learned is our ore has the ability to, you know, and, and the luxury to choose a method. We, we can do a couple of these different methods, um, and the question for us is where to do it. Uh, access to, you know, renewable, sustainable power, access to acid um, is very important um, as we do this. And we're assessing numerous sites today to develop a, you know, and, and to understand where the, the most benefit is for our company as we choose where to process material. Now, you know, the, it doesn't help and doesn't hurt. I mean, it doesn't hurt that we are sitting in kind of, you know, a very unique time and place where the U.S. and Canadian governments um, and North America in general is trying to build an industry that doesn't exist, like I said. And with, you know, the U.S.'s announcement of the, uh, um, the IRA Inflation Reduction Act with Canadian governments, you know, push to, to, uh, to leverage the, the natural resource, uh, you know, kind of potential we have in the country, um, there is a very, very uh, unique tailwind for companies like ours to build um, build out uh, long-term supply chains to support this. Um, that comes with, you know, whether it's subsidies, long-term tax incentives, um, a lot of multinational uh, end users. For instance, the Volkswagens of the world, the you know, LG, Stellantis of the world, all announcing very large battery projects in North, on North American soil. All these projects will require uh, a long-term security of supply, and that's where we, you know, we see a massive opportunity. Um, you know, again, the, the the results are there from just a very short period of time. You know, the U.S. has announced, um, and North American General has announced a multitude of of uh, plants and capacity growing as we get to 2030, um, and a lot of that they have announced includes uh, manganese in those cathodes in those plants. So we see a very big supply opportunity, demand that hasn't existed, that is now being created into this next decade. And I think it just, the forecast is to grow even more. So 
again, this is this is something that isn't built and hasn't been built into the last uh, supply and demand fundamentals over the last four or five years, as this is just coming in, you know, over the last 18 months. Um, you know, another big piece of the US's plan is the the mandated uh, procurement, where this is procured from and being supply from uh, North American local and locally deemed product. Um, there is a scramble right now from the producers and the, the the people procuring this to get to make sure that they meet these so they don't miss out on the subsidies and the benefits that come along with it. So again, th there is there's a lot of levels of support, um, obviously, to drive the growth in our in the industry, drive a, you know, a support and make sure that it's it's underpinned um, and solid footing. But we companies like ours are the beneficiaries of this. So, you know, transitioning to the future, going back to the net zero and um, Paris Accord, the um, the economic transition scenario, you know, manganese is, according to Bloomberg NEF, manganese is at the top of the pile here when it comes to growth. Um, we we see this as an, a big, big opportunity, and this is because of the, that fundamental um, kind of jurisdictional um dominance seen by China and processing of high purity manganese sulfate. So, you know, we we intend to kind of be the the underpinning for the Western world supply of this. Uh, we have, and I'll get into a very large uh, resource um, and a growing district. So the Woodstock project, um, let's see if I was a laser up here. So this is our initial deposit, Plymouth. This is one that's been studied for, you know, we did, a, there was a PEA done about a, uh, 2014, looking at it for the steel sector metallurgical work done to create an EMM product. Um, these Hartford deposits, all this was identified about 50 years ago, looking at steel, looking at iron and manganese. Um, at, at the time, 50 years ago, Plymouth was estimated to be about 50 million tons at 8%. Same, or 8 to 10%. Hartford was, the North and South Hartford, each were estimated to be the same levels. Um, you know, I think what we'll show you what Plymouth is right now, what we've defined to be, but more importantly, as we move southeast towards this is the main the border of Maine right here this here right here is about is, is I-95 goes right in and Halton Maine is about you know it's about a 14 minute drive from mine site to Halton Maine where there's rail access to the U.S. that goes south and goes west so infrastructure wise you know we're sitting in a fantastic jurisdiction you've got to the set to this area to go east is St. John New Brunswick deep water port a big uh, kind of oil and gas distribution center for Canada and as you go up to the north, you've got Bathurst, which is the Bathurst camp is a big old mining camp that's, uh, you know, you've got Glencore there, has a big um, lead smelter, and you have water access all the way down to Detroit and the automotive highway. So couldn't ask for a better position. And we've got these exploration potential here, which we will be exploring this summer to define. Um, you know, land package, we kind of talked a little bit about that. Um, you know, the, the deposit itself, this starts at, you know, some, you know, Plymouth as average starts about nine meters from surface. The zones are 80 to 150 meters uh, in width. Um, this is less, and we characterize it less of a mining operation. This is more of like a mineral sands moving. This is a processing business. Um, as long as you have a deposit like ours where, and I'll, I'll show you, you know, we, when we plan on and are looking, we're assessing right now the Potential mine plans, looking at um, setting up a pit, you know, there's potential for this to be the the strip ratio to be zero. So we're just moving ore around based on the size of, of our deposit. So this is our updated resource M and I, um, and just to put to give it characterization, in uh, the previous was an inferred resource of 43 million tons at about 10 percent. We drilled out uh, last year. We put uh, about 5,000 meters of drilling in, 7,000 meters of drilling. We took that 43 millions of inferred tons and turned it into 56.7 millions of MI at 10 over 10%, and then added another 17, 18 million at 10%. Total of 73 million tons um, at a, over 10% grade, which for a carbonate deposit is, you know, it, it is, it, it, uh, there's nothing out there that, is, that compares to it. Um, you know, it, it's pit constrained, um, and I'll show. You know, the, the interesting part is most of the inferred sits at the bottom of the pit. So as I said, you know, to, to when you're developing a resource and developing those pit shells, 
Um, to include that inferred, you open up the, you push the walls back. But if we didn't want to leave it there and just mine a 56 million ton, that pit would just contain M and I resource throughout the whole thing with very, very, if not zero, very little strip. Um, you know, as I said, the Hartford potential, we just put out a press release actually, I think it was Tuesday. Um, we've been drilling Hartford. Again, we're seeing, we're seeing zones of 80 meters over 10%, very similar. We saw at Plymouth. And our intention here is to aggressively have two drills drilling right now, uh, aggressively drill Hartford, um, and in 2024, put out a, an initial maiden resource at Hartford. Um, but we expect, you know, we're anticipating to be very similar to what we see at Plymouth. Um, and, you know, that gives us confidence that we're going to be, as we get into the into 2024, we will be over 100 million tons at 10% grade, uh, which will put us, you know, uh, from a from a carbonate standpoint, um, ahead, of the, ahead of the curve of everybody. Um, so as we move forward, you know, this is the work we're doing, Plymouth feasibility work into Q4 of this year. Um, we're going to be focusing on the pre-concentration optimization with the work was done initially in 2014. Looking at this, I think it's more important today uh, as we look at, as we look at where our processing site will be and who our partner will be and how that moves uh, forward. You know, I think we've, um, you know, environmental studies, and I kind of go back to the beginning where I said about our stakeholders. I, um, we, we have the former premier of the province on staff working with us, helping us understand who's a member of the community, who's a, a ran you know, owns a ranch in the community, a fisherman, um, helping us understand the dynamics. So we've been working with the Brun New Brunswick government uh, for the past 18 months, working on um, all aspects of what we're doing from a drilling to our proposed plans. And one of the big initiatives has been our environmental work. And we've already finished a year of baseline studies we're going to complete another year with the intention of our um, application to be submitted uh, this year. So we feel like we're a very, very far advanced in that process. Um, you know, the processing site and partnerships, this is this is ongoing. This is this is a very key part. And I expect that to be run in parallel with our optimization uh, feasibility work at the mine site. But the, you know, the, the processing work. Um, you know, it, it, it's again, like I said, it's not a matter of, of how you process it or if you can process it. It's really where um, we have a, a good understanding of that. And I think our ore provides and, and it lends itself to to being high quality when it comes to cost um, and then additional exploration activities. You know, I think by the as we move to 2024, uh, a new resource at Hartford, additional work. It's going to be demonstrated that we have a, a global district of you know high quality carbonate hosted manganese, um, which is it is you know it, it's not easily found, um, especially in the Western world. Um, and you know we see carbonate deposits of six and seven percent being try attempting to be developed, right? Um, and you know even looking at traditionally oxide deposits that would be comparable would be plus thirty percent. Um, so you know I think we're in a very very good position. Um, and so, you know, I think that's where we move now, you know, as a public company, we, you know, we have our capital structure, I think is very strong. We have about, you know, management owns about 10% management board. We have a major shareholder who I worked closely with owns 20% of the company, um, you know, in the strategic associates and family and friends, you know, this represents 52% of the stock and represents about eight people. So, you know, it is a very tightly held uh, shareholder base, uh, very well supported. Um, you know, we are. We, we've been focused on this um, and making sure that, you know, when, as we move and the, when the value catalysts come, that we have a good control of where our stock is and who, and who's going to support it. Um, you know, we've got an experienced team, uh, you know, our chairman, John Kearney has been uh, in the mining business for a long time, um, a lawyer by trade as uh, many public companies. Like I said, I, myself, I've, I've spent time um, in the resource business for the last 15 to set 20 years. Uh, Richard Pinkton and David Allward, who is a key member of the team, is the former Premier of New Brunswick, um, you know, helping us really uh, develop that uh, that relationship that's going to get this and move this forward. So, you know, as we move forward, I think the key things to, to note, you know, is the size and quality of our deposit, you know, where we exist today in in the in North America, there in nowhere in time has there been a better place to have a battery metals project. Uh, or a project in, to develop into a new in, for a new industry, and then you know in, in general our our relationships and our focus on the community and partnerships. I think we um, were positioned uh, very well to be uh, to be successful and look forward to 24, 23, and twenty four. Excellent, thank you.
Great presentation. Thanks so much, Matthew. Very much appreciated that. Now, uh, there's an interesting uh, discussion going on over in Auditorium 2 in a, a few minutes. Um, there's a company in there that was it was booted from the local boards for regulatory reasons last month, but uh, there's a fellow called um, James Lamb, he's an amazing human. He remains convinced that the emerging minor Mali resources, who are one of the next speakers, will be back as a public company in the second half of this year. So go and uh, have a look at that one if that's of interest to you. Here in Auditorium One, we are rounding out this break before we head to morning tea with some more or another opportunity to learn about what we're investing in and where the opportunities are for us. I'd like to invite Ellie Wang up. Ellie is a senior analyst for CRU. Where are you hiding, Ellie? Up the front. Fantastic. All right. So Ellie's topic is for us today, critical minerals, where to now? Would you please make her very welcome? Wait, she's retreating. <laughs> She's retracing her steps. While she does that, I'll tell you a little bit about her. So she joined CAU in 2019. She works as a senior analyst covering Chinese and Indonesian nickel industry based in the Shanghai office. She's got a 13 years of experience in nickel, ferro alloy and the copper industry. And before she joined CAU, she worked as the Asia-based metal editor at Fast Markets, where you also worked on nickel, on manganese ore, so you would have been very interested in our last presentation, correct? Yeah. And also ferrochrome and copper from 2014 all the way through to 2019. Let's start that again. A warm round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, ladies and gentlemen. I am Ali Wang, based in CIU Shanghai office. Uh, I'm looking after nickel market in China and in Indonesia. It is my honor here to share our CIU's price forecast for 2023 with all of you. My presentation will start from current price and review 2022 forecast 2023 nickel demand from stainless steel sector and battery sector. Then look at the supply from China and Indonesia in the two years and give a forecast for 2023 nickel price in the end. Uh, firstly, uh, we can see currently the LM nickel price has fallen by over 20% since the start of February because the demand recovery in China has fallen short of expectation and heightened concerns over US and European inflation. The bank crisis is also winning on sentiment. Uh, from the right chart, we have converted Chinese nickel sulfate and Chinese NPI price into donor and pattern nickel basis. Compare the two prices with LME cash price. You can see from LME nickel price dropping down, uh, with the with the nickel prices dropping down, nickel sulfate price now is almost parity with the LME cash price. Well, in 2022, nickel sulfate price was in big discount based on LME cash price. Similarly, now. NPI price is around 70% of LME cash price. So NPI's discount against LME cash price also has much lower. The chart shows uh, LME nickel price now has gradually back to reflect fundamentals since the first quarter of 2022. And uh, from this chart, uh, uh, let us check Charlie stainless steel demand. From left chart, we can see NPI price has almost the same trend as stainless steel cash price and Shifi, which means stainless steel pr producers have the absolute bargaining power on NPI price. Due to big surplus of so-called class two nickel or NPI and Valley, Chile's NPI price dropped very rapidly. In the coming months, we possibly to see more Indonesian NPI shipped back to China due to a major stainless steel producer disrupted majority of its output in the first quarter of 2023 in Indonesia. Hence, NPI price currently in, Indonesia, in China has not bottomed out. Uh, from the right chart, we are forecasting a 5% year-on-year growth for Chinese stainless steel output in 2023 to 34.4 million tons of which we are forecasting 300 series stainless steel to have a 7.6% year-on-year growth in China in 2023. That is following a 2% decline in China in 2022. 
uh, however, given the very weak stainless steel demand, we're likely to slightly lower the Chinese stainless steel growth in 2023 in, uh, in the next uh, outlook. Market now is expecting in the second half of 2023, Chinese stainless steel demand could pick up. As for Indonesia, there was around 300,000 tons of output decline for stainless steel in the first quarter. We're assuming in the second quarter, the disrupted capacity for the resuming gradually. Majority of Indonesia stainless steel's distillation remains China. Given the recession demand in Europe and US, we see in 2023, China remaining the main driver of stainless steel production growth. Currently, we are giving a 6.8% of year-year -year growth on global stainless steel, uh, while giving remaining bearish sentiment globally in stainless steel market currently, we possibly to lower the growth slightly in coming outlook. Uh, after stainless steel, we can see the uh, battery demand from this slide. Uh, not only the demand in stainless steel currently is gloomy, demand for nickel sulfate or nickel containing precursor also have lower turn better. Chinese nickel sulfate output grew by 40% year to 388,000 in 2022 for sufficing the strong growth from Chinese EV sector. Where since November, demand for nickel sulfate became slow. Until April, we remain seeing very thin trading volume for small nickel sulfate cargoes in China. In January and February, we can see from the left chart, output has declined to 30 to 32,000 tons level. Meanwhile, Chinese nickel contained precursor output in the right chart also is much lower than fourth quarter of 2022. So weak demand has pushed battery raw material prices, including nickel surface price down. After looking the main demand picture, we can observe the supply side now. So uh, for 2023, global supply is forecast to rise by 11% to 3.5 million tons nickel metal. Growth in XMPI production will see the main driver behind the increase. A large part of the rise in XMPI production will come into form of nickel sulfate output in China. Uh, we are expecting Indonesia MPI to rise by 180,000 tons to 1.3 million tons. Given the relatively low cost of producing MPI in Indonesia, we're assuming Chinese MPI falls in this year. However, given the prospect of continued oversupply in the class two market, global MPI or ferronic output could be lower than our, uh, than our forecasting. Yeah, from this slide, we can see the major uh, Indonesia MPI uh, uh, industry. From the left chart, we can see the major uh, MPI output from Indonesia is coming from like Morovali, Qingshan, Weida Bay, Qingshan, also West Dragons, Kola Wei Industry Park. So from the deep lunai from Morovali, we can see from 2022, there are some output of MPI decline. That is because more nice has shifted into converting into MPI mat. And uh, we can see the yellow light, which is the strongest increase is from Weida Bay Industry Park. Uh, but for this year, there are also some nights were shifting into uh, producing match in Wida Bay Industry Park. Uh, for others, we also can see very strong growth. That is because uh, like PT Lijian in OB Island, the RKF finances also have commissioned. Um, from the right chart, we can see the Chinese MPI production. So we are forecasting in 2023, uh, the Chinese MPI is likely to fall to a LU production of 325,000 tons as increasing imports from Indonesia displace higher cost domestic production. And after 2024 to 2027, uh, we're forecasting with the uh, Philippines all uh, decreasing the Chinese MPI output to be around 300,000 tons. After MPI, we can check the mat uh, supply. 
So uh, just now we have talked about the very big discount between MPI and the LME cash price. So that's the incentive for MPI shifting to producing mat. Uh, from the left chart, we can see the mat growth also is very strong. So it started from December of 2021 in uh, at Moro Valley Industry Park. Then in 2022, uh, we have seen the match output uh, uh, in Indonesia has increased to 137,000 ton. And with more nice uh, shifting to producing mat to feed the nickel sulfate output as well as castles output, we forecast in 2023, the nickel mat from Indonesia uh, is estimated at 273,000 tons. And uh, in the right table, uh, we can see from this theory, because of the big spread between uh, nickel sulfate and uh, refined nickel, there are several Chinese castle producers or Nickel sulfate producers, they are announcing they will start to uh, produce castles. So uh, in January, GM has started their castles capacity uh, from January, and uh, now it is operating very smoothly. And the uh, Dingxing, which is a cooperating project uh, in Murawali Industry Park, uh, cooperated by Qingshan and the uh, CNGR Zhongwei with uh, 50,000 tons of capacity. The market is expecting it will commission in the second half of 2023. So uh, GM, uh, Qingshan, CNGR, Huayou, uh, they have all announced uh, the capacity for producing nickel castles. So uh, it it is very, uh, so we have seen in the first quarter, the Chinese domestic castles output has increased marginally with, with the Indonesia castle output also coming to stream. Uh, we, it is possible that China will import further less uh, refined nickel from outside of China. And after that, we can look at the H4 side. Uh, H4 also have a very rapid growth in the from 2021 to 2023. So currently, there are four H4 projects commissioned in Indonesia. Uh, all of them are China based. So there are PT Nigen, uh, PT Huayue, and the PT QMB. Uh, the fourth will be PT Huafei, which will commission in the second half of this year. So Lijian and uh, Huayue both are very successful, have, have operated exceeded their capacity. And uh, PT QMB has started ship their first shipment from November back to China. And the QMB has posted guidance of 25,000 tons of alu nickel metal for 2023. So we will see uh, with Huafei commissioning in 2023, the H4 output in Indonesia uh, is possibly to reach 151,000 tons. And the right chart is the Indonesia MHP export on a nickel equivalent basis. We can see the MHP not only export to China, but also uh, South Korea producer also take some of them. And uh, another news I want to share is recently Legend also have commissioned their nickel sulfate capacity of 57,000 ton nickel metal in OBI land, yeah, which is matching their three nights of MHP producing. Mm, because in this year, uh, the consensus is nickel sulfate will be in big surplus. So although the capacity has commissioned but low shoe, the production will be high. So what does this intermediate mean for China nickel sulfate? We can see from the left chart. So the left chart has shown by the first quarter of 2022, the intermediates, which are mass and MHP, uh, it has taken account for about 75% of total nickel sulfate uh, producing. That has decreased uh, the dissolution of brick cuts 
So the yellow, uh, yellow part is the dissolution of nickel brickets. We can see it, it decreased significantly. And uh, from the right chart, that is China imposed of MHP, MSP, and MATS in 2022. We can see in 2022, here is a very big jump for around 311,000 300, uh, tons of nickel metal. The trade will uh, keep in this year. And uh, for, uh, we'll, I will give a very quick uh, review for this. This is the prices behind the raw material. So because of the less dissolution of brickets, we have seen the brickets duty-free brickets leave China. Premium has done a lot and uh, just keep stable at very low level. But MHP, because it is the lowest uh, most economic raw material for feeding nickel sulfate. So we can see uh, the MHP pebbles with the LME price drop down. It has sold to currently around six, uh, 70 to 76% based on LME price. Uh, finally, uh, let us check the price forecast for 2023. So we have seen more downside risk for nickel price. Yeah, uh, that is because of the uh, expectation about cost of monetary policy in the key economics and also the GDP of China target 5% has disappointed majority of market participants. And the, another reason from supply is the MPI to match conversion possibly is higher than we are forecasting, leading to a more visible class one surplus. Uh, from the upside risk, uh, the additional sanctions against Russia disrupt nickel exports and also the additional H4 in the MAT capacity if they are de delayed, then there will be some support for the nickel price. Uh, this is our nickel team from CIU. So we have very experienced for simple analyst like Nico Xia, who has in this industry since uh, 1995. And uh, Arena and I are based in Shanghai office. Uh, we both look into the battery side, so uh, can reach out to me. Well, uh, we both are in the conference site. And uh, there are also uh, battery experts and the stainless steel experts in the slide. So feel free to reach out to me if you have any further questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellie. Great way to round out session number one. Guess what? We're getting out 10 minutes before the other auditorium. So you can either use that and you can go and grab yourself to the front of the, the line up there for morning tea. Or you might like to nip in because there's 10 minutes to go of that conversation I was mentioning with Mr. Lamb with Mali Resources. So if you want to go and hear him and see what he has to say about them becoming a public listed company again, go and do that. Otherwise, we've got a bit of a focus on uranium coming up in the next uh, session. We've got a fireside chat and we've got a panel discussion. So lots to, lots to have, come back and, and have a listen to. Thank you, everyone.